his point was, if you can learn to control the sin of the tongue, then you've learned the secret of controlling the whole body. If you learn the secret of how to deal, how to deal with personal sin in, in one area, you've learned the secret in every area. Doesn't, whether, doesn't matter whether it's mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. The same thing is applied to each of those areas of personal sin. The mechanics is the same. And so uh, we were addressing that last time, <clears throat> and we dealt with a confession of personal sin. <clears throat> and so that we're going to come back to that idea today. Um, last week, we dealt with confession of sin out of 1 John 1, 7 through 9. 7, 8, 9 are very important. Now, around here, we, we talk about confession of personal sin based on 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. But see that little word cleansing? We're going to deal with that today. But that little word cleansing takes us back to verse 7. Where he says that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. <clears throat> when you confess your sin, when you confess your personal sin as a believer, the blood of Christ is extended to the Christian life. Only the blood of Christ can forgive sin. There's no, there's no, other, there's no other deal. <clears throat> and, but the difference between salvation and the Christian life, in salvation, it cleanses us from all sin, past, present, future, the blood of Christ. And when we believe it, we get saved. You know, if we believe the gospel, he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, we get saved by it. But when it comes to personal sin in the Christian life, we're dealing with Adam's sin over there. When it comes to personal sin in the Christian life, then it's confession of sin that triggers the continuous. You know, when he says, when he says that the blood of Christ cleanses us, he puts it in the present tense. And the present tense means continuous action. And the act of voice is the blood of Christ cleansing and that's the sovereignty of God working that system in the kingdom of God. And so for the believer, when he confesses his sin, the blood of Christ cleanses him from the sin, not for salvation, but for spirituality. Because the evidence of personal sin in your life, the evidence of carnality is personal sin. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. And the way you deal, deal with it to get, get out of carnality and back to spirituality is by confession of sin. We're, we're going we're gonna to take this and, and listen, all that, listen, all 1 John 1, 9 does is deal with sin. It doesn't deal with the root. You see, the, if, the, the confession of sin doesn't deal with habitual sin. <laughs> Come on now. You, 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 whatever your trend is <clears throat> that's connected with your heart, you say, habitual sin comes from the heart. And unless the heart is changed, this habitual sin continues, no matter how many times you confess it. Confession doesn't change your heart. It changes the cleansing to restore you to spirituality. It changes carnality to spirituality. Doesn't change the human heart. The only thing, the human heart is where you think and operate and your belief systems are. You'll never correct them. You'll stay in that habitual pattern of committing sin, confessing, committing sin, confessing in the same areas of your trend. You got jealousy, you're jealous. You're, you, you're quick to anger, all these kind of things that are habitual. You know, listen, if you just track your confession of sin over a week, you will know that you have a pattern. You have trends. How are you going to break those? 1 John 1, 9 doesn't resolve the deceitful heart. The Word of God does. 
It's the only thing that resolves it is a change of thinking. We're going to talk about that today as we approach this subject matter. I want you to, let me, let me open with prayer. All right? Let's just open with prayer. Let's be sure we're spiritual. Spiritual is a great key to dealing with the deceitful heart. Can't do it without it. And that's the key. You got to be spiritual, but you got to deal with the deceitful heart. Otherwise, this pattern of habitual sin in your life, these trends, areas of your life, it's going to continue and continue and continue. And uh, you're going to keep saying to yourself, well, how come I can't win over this? How come I've been a Christian for 20 years and I still have the same problem? How is that possible? I'm going to tell you how to correct it today. I'm going to tell you how to correct it. Tell you how to deal with that habitual problem. You got to win on two fronts. You got to win on the confession of sin, the fact that you commit a personal sin. You got to win on that front. But you also got to win on the front of a deceitful heart. You're being deceived within your own self. You're deceiving yourself. And that's got to quit. You got to stop that stuff. So, Father, we're thankful today. We've come today, Father, to study your word and understand a deceitful heart. Confession of sin does not deal with the, it deals with carnality. It deals with personal sin. It deals with choices we're making. It doesn't deal with the core of where these choices are coming from. So encourage our hearts today, Father, to understand that we got to root it out. How do we do that? We take the, we take the deceitful part of that, the cosmic system, off and put the divine viewpoint on. And then we apply that divine viewpoint every time it comes up. We need to understand that today, Father. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister. That's the importance of inhale, exhale of the word of God. So encourage our hearts to understand that today, Father, so that we can have victory in our Christian life within the, the, the roots of our problems in our Christian life. Root them out, Father, today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, last week we talked about this 1 John 1 uh, 7 through 9, along with other passage, but in, in, I want to show you something in Corinthians. If you go to Corinthians, the third chapter, he deals with carnality versus spirituality, and that's the importance of confession of sin. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men. That's pneumatikos. Pneumatikos. That's a P N E U M A T I K O S. Pneumatikos. And, and so he said, I wanted to speak to you as spiritual men. He's in Bible class, I, I, but I couldn't. But as rather to men of the flesh as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink. That's the, the appetite level of need, the appetite level of need of uh, immature believers. I, he says, I, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Solid food is for the mature believer. That's, that's Hebrews 5, uh, you know, 13, 14. I gave you milk. I couldn't give you solid food. Indeed, even now, you are not able. And this is what he says, because you are, watch this, for you are still fleshly. Now, this word in the Greek language is S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. It comes from the word sark, the word flesh, S-A-R-X. Now, this is the, this spelled in the Greek language, S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. Now, when he comes back later and he says, you are fleshly because there is still jealousy and strife among you. See, it, your Bible is calling this carnal. The word fleshly is the Latin word for fleshly, the Latin word, carnal. You are carnal. And 
you haven't grown in the word of God to root this out. You have patterns of behavior that are our personal sin. You understand that? You are, he says, you, you are still fleshy for since there is jealousy and strife among you still. Are you not fleshly? Watch now. Listen to me now. S-A-R-K-I-K-O-S. Change the ending. He went from I-N-O-S to I-K-O-S. Now, he's talking about the same thing. He's talking about carnality. He's talking about carnality. On the one hand, when he uses it with an I-N-O-S, he's talking about the, the source of carnality being the sin nature. The lust gratification of the sin nature. When he uses I-K-O-S, notice the context. The context, for since you are jealous and strife exist among you, you are I-K-O-S. You're in a pattern of personal sin. When you confess your sin, it takes you out of carnality and puts you into spirituality, but it doesn't take care of your immaturity. Please tell me you hear that. I'm going to read it again. And brethren... And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to men of the flesh, Sark, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk. I wanted to give you solid food, but you are not able to receive it. What's he talking about? He's talking about the word of God on a meat level, not a milk level, not dealing with salvation and basics, dealing with the Christian way of life. And you have a pattern in your life, a pattern that you know is sinful. There is a trend, and you have the same trend, and you haven't broke that trend. That's a worldly system of thinking. I don't care if it came from the church or from the world, worldliness is cosmos diabolicus thinking. And you have not broke that cycle, and you're in this terrible pattern of habitual sins that you haven't been, been able to break in 20, 25 years. Now, how is that possible, you say? So he says, for you are still fleshly, changed it to IKOS. He says, for since there is death today, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like the world, like mere men of the world? Are you not? I mean, you're acting like unbelievers do have, have this, and they don't have any solution in their life. They need to get saved. But here you are, you are saved, and you're not fully spiritual in your life, in maturity, not because you don't know the truth, but you don't apply it. I come along, he says, I want to teach you how to live the dynamics of the Christian life, victorious in your life. I can't do it because you're in a terrible pattern of immaturity because of patterns of habitual sin in your life. And he's talking to the Corinthian church. That's a pretty powerful passage, by the way. It's a pretty powerful passage. And I don't know that you have the stamina to get it. But if you don't get it, you're a milk drinker, not a meat eater, though you think you're a meat eater because you sit among in a church that speaks spiritually strong words, and you're among a group of people that have gone into their spiritual maturity you, you are comfortable being around those people, but you're not comfortable in your own skin about it. That's who he's addressing to, and that's who I'm talking to. 
You've got to break these patterns. You've got to know, I'm going to teach you how to break them. This is not, listen, you can get saved in an instant. You can become spiritual. You can get this, but you better get it. You'd better get it. Because you're sitting in the right place with the right guy, and you need to listen. You need to listen. Let me show you. Let's go to Mark. Jesus, Jesus tried to get his disciples to understand this. Mark the seventh chapter, listen to what he says. Mark the seventh chapter, verse 20 through 23. He talked about this very subject to his disciples. And they're all over, they're all over legalism and clean and defile. Clean and defile. All about legalism. Here's what he says. I'll start with verse 17. And when leaving the multitude, he had entered the house. His disciples questioned about the parable he had just given. About It's not what goes in a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of him. It's not what goes in a man. Because they were, they, were, they were claiming, if you put that in your mouth, oh, you're going to go to hell for sure. And if you do that, you're going to... And he went like, it's not, what goes, it's not what goes in the mouth and into the stomach that defiles a man. It's what's in his heart that comes out of his mouth. You with me? Well, I'm just giving you the background. It's the side of side. I don't get the parable. <laughs> I don't get what you're talking about. He says to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? And the answer is yes. Do, do you not understand? And they don't. The question now becomes, are you willing to understand? You haven't understood up to now. So I'm going to address this face on, eyeball to eyeball. And let's see if you have the guts to do it. <laughs> do you not understand, that's what his point is to get them, that whatever goes into a man from outside is not what defiles him corrupts his soul. It's, that's not what corrupts him. It's not what defiles him. It's not what determines whether he's moral or immoral or spiritual or not spiritual. Because it goes not into his heart, it goes into his stomach and then out uh, and then is eliminated. Thus he declares all food clean. He was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles or corrupts his soul. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil, cosmos diabolicus thinking, such as fornication, theft, murder, adultery, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit sensualities, envy, slander, pride, foolish. He calls them evil things. That's cosmos diabolicus, whether it comes from the church or it comes from the street or the university or wherever. It, whenever it opposes the truth of the word of God, it's cosmos diabolicus. All these, these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Where do they come from? What is the source? The human heart. Now, I'm not talking about the one that pumps, listen to me. I'm not talking about the heart that pumps blood. I'm listen to me now. I'm talking about the heart that pumps beliefs. Do you hear me? Because there's a difference between the mind, the noose, and the cardia. And the cardia is where you store what you really believe. And the word of God is the only powerful tool that God has to root the evil out and to replace it with the divine 
truth of God's word. Let me show it to you. Let's go to Hebrews. Go to the book of Hebrews. Look, if you can't take notes, at least turn Bible open. Okay? Days. Now, if you grew up in this church or been around Baraka, you'll know this verse whether you believe it or don't. See, I know a lot of people that read this verse. I know a lot of people quote it and don't use it. I'm telling you that you've got to use this verse to correct this problem. Are you with me? Now, look, look I'm hollering, but just relax. I, I'm not hollering anybody in here. I'm just hollering. So just relax. Now, look, listen to verse 12, and I want to show you why the Word of God is so important to this problem. Watch this now. Watch this. For the Word of God is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. You know what that is? That's a machaira. That's that Roman sword that stuck you in the middle and cut you both ways. It was not to kill you. It was to, it was to take you off the battlefield. It was to put you out of, put you out of commission. So you couldn't maneuver. Just stick, cut, stick, cut, stick. Stick, cut either way. It's a Makaira. Now watch what that Makaira does. See, here's what people miss. <laughs> Listen to me now. It sticks and cuts both ways. Why? I'm just telling you, it's a two-edged sword. <laughs> now watch. Now what, it, what is that? A living a, a, a live, living, sharper than a two-edged sword. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? What's the subject? The Word of God. Right? All right. The Word of God. Now, what he's talking about, the Word of God here, he's talking about categorical Bible doctrines, two-edged sword. The Word of God is alive. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Now watch this. Now watch this two-edged sword. Piercing as far as the division of the what? What? How, how, many, how many is that? Right? Two-edged sword that does what? Cuts two ways. Pray, pray to tell me you know that. It's, it's called a two-edged sword. Right? It goes in, it goes... It cuts to the soul, it cuts to the spirit, right? That's, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharp, right? You know, what that, you know what that is? That's the word of God that's become alive volitionally in your life. It's become alive. It's become alive. And it's sharper than the two-edged sword. You understand? Watch this. Both the joint and the marrow. How many I got? I got two, right? I think I got a pattern going here. What's he doing? What's, wh what is the word of God doing? <laughs> you see that two-edged sword? See that two-edged sword? <laughs> Abel, what is the word of God that's now at work? Alive, sharper two-edged sword. Soul to the spirit. <laughs> Join the marrow. <laughs> right? And we're cutting deeper. Watch this. And able to judge the thoughts and attentions. How many I got? I got me too. My, my. I wonder where this 2 2 2 is coming from. It's coming from a double edged sword. You understand? When the word of God becomes alive in your life, when the word of God becomes alive in your life volitionally, and you receive it, that word of God begins to go into your life, and it begins to cut both ways. Boom, 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 boom. Until it gets down to the core 
of your belief system until it gets down to the core of what you really believe about yourself, about God, about the church, about the word of God, what you really believe, not what you tell me you believe, what you really believe when the rubber hits the pavement in your life. That's what I'm talking about. And what's the last word? Tell me the last word. The heart. He's cutting his way, the word of God, cutting his way through the flesh and the muck and the mud of your life. Boom, 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 boom. Till he gets down to the thoughts, the judgment and the thoughts and the critics of your heart. Because, boom, that's where, the, that's where it is at. You understand that? I doubt it. No, I really doubt it. I'll tell you whether or not you really believe it next week. Before this day's over, you start to work on you. Before this day, before this sun sets, if God answers my prayer, he'll start to work in my church. Because I'm going to tell you, this is the last of straw here. This 1 John 1, 9, that's baby steps. 1 John 1, 9 is baby stuff. That's what you teach young believers. And that's a good truth to know. It takes you out of carnal into spiritual. But listen, it takes the word of God to cut through your fleshly muck and mire of your stuff. That two-edged sword goes in there and he starts cutting this way and cutting that way and cutting this way and cutting that way until he gets down to the bolts and nuts of your life, your real true belief system. A judge, the thoughts and intentions of the human heart You come to Bible study, it goes in one ear and out the other. It never gets to the heart. You never, you never let it cut away your stuff. You never let it cut away your stuff and face up to it. When it gets down to the thoughts and the critics of your heart, you run like a scalded cat. You run away from it. And this is a good thing. This is the word of God becoming alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. This is a good thing. But it will radically change your life. And your life needs to be radically changed. Like mine. Do you understand that? You've heard this verse all your life. You never understood it. Word of God is a powerful, sharper than two-edged sword, dividing the souls. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to change. It's got to change. God wants to get out of the core of who you are, what you believe, what you think, what you really think. You know what's, whole, listen, you know why he wants to do it? Listen to me. You know why he's wanting to do it? Because you're made in the image according to the likeness of God, and that's not enough. That's nowhere near enough. Did you know that? Unbelievers have that. Did you not know that? Did you not know that all mankind is born in the image according to the likeness of God? And that's not enough. He wants that image turned into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, until he is the captain of your heart. That'll never be. 
It'll be a pipe dream. So that when others see you, they see Christ. So that when they looked and saw Jesus, they saw God. Because the Son reflected the image of the Father. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, really? Really? Until you root it out of your core, your core will never reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Because that word of God in there is about, about the word becoming flesh and dwelling in us. Do you not understand that? Have I been so long with you that you don't understand this? You must understand this. You must understand this. Because who you are is in your core. And you and your core should be one person in Christ that house should not be divided that house should not be divided that's what we call the new man that new man is Christ it's not reformed religion That's some kind of reformed lifestyle. I'm talking about transformed into the image of God's Son. Transformed, Romans the 12th chapter, transformed into the image of Christ. That ain't going to happen. It is not going to happen unless you deal with your core values. And you know you got them because you got patterns in your life that need to be broken. And you know it. And if you don't, people who love you and are close to you know it. And on a good day, they have the courage to tell you that. On a good day. The deceitful heart is what is behind the habitual personal sins. A deceitful heart. A deceitful heart. At the Jerusalem conference, in Acts, the 15th chapter, Paul and the grace-oriented guys brought a message to the church that was under attack. The key doctrine of that day was grace. And the key word that kept coming up in this conversation was the cleansing of the heart. And the cleansing of the heart is a grace operation. You take the word of God in, and the word of God just goes to work, starts cutting through. The surgeon has got to get down to correct the problem. The surgeon cuts through this layer, and the surgeon cuts through that layer, and he cuts through this layer, and he cuts through that layer to get down to where the problem is so that we can work on it and correct it. The cleansing of the heart. In Acts, the 15th chapter, verse 8 and 9, the grace people testified, the God who knows the heart, the God who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them both, talking about the Jew and the Gentiles, giving them both the Holy Spirit, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us also, and made no distinction between us and them, the Jew and the Gentile. Cleansing, that's the same word that's used, always, always use cleansing. Cleansing their hearts by what? Faith. I, I say, you don't, you, you, don't have to pay, you don't have to pay for it before you. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Pick that paper up. You can pick that paper up before the week's over, John. They can go to the internet and pick this paper up. You know what? Listen, cleansing by faith. See, that's what, that's, that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Cleanse by faith. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the what? The word of God. And once the word of God is heard and received, the word of God begins to cut. Ching, 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 ching. Listen, until it gets down to where you really live, where your value system really is. Where your belief system dwells is in your heart. And unless there is a cleansing of the heart by faith, nothing changes except on the surface. Just the tip of the iceberg, never below surface. Your wife tells you, your husband tells you, your children tell you, your neighbors tell you, your best friends tell you, and you blow it off. You blow it off. Catharizo is used this way in 1 John 1, 7 and 9. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then he goes into the Confession business. You see, this cleansing of 1 John 1, 9 restores you to spirituality. It doesn't deal with the heart. You know what deals with the heart? Faith. Down in your core values of what you really believe to be true because you operate from that inner secret cell block of your soul, of your heart. When the word of God even gets near it, you, sh you shut it down. Because this is going to be, this, listen, this is going to take radical surgery. This is radical. Confession of personal sin does not correct a deceitful heart which lies behind the habitual sin. When Adam and Eve violated the command, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God dealt with their heart as well as their sin. You need to read this in Genesis, the third chapter. The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That was truth. That was true. He stole the, listen, he's, you, know where he st you know where he stole the word of God from? Right out of her heart. You know how he did it? He got her to go against it. That's cosmos evil. Did she know that God said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge? Did she know it? Yeah. Did she believe it? Yes. How did he get her to change it? He hit her core, he could, her, hit her core belief system and got her to go against the truth. She didn't throw the truth out. She went against it. She volitionally went against it. And when she did it, listen, when she did it, she deceived herself. Now, she wants to blame the serpent, but God holds her accountable. Did you notice that? Oh, the serpent, the serpent, the serpent, the serpent. He went, no, no, no. Eve, 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 and Eve. Who changed what you believe? Who changed what you believe, Eve? I did. Yeah, you did. You bought into Cosmos Diabolicus. And so he deals with that with her. He deals with that as well with her. You can read more about it in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, when Paul talks about this, and he has the problem in the Corinthian church. And he talks to Timothy about it in 1 Timothy 2, 14. A deceitful mind and heart comes from the cosmos diabolical system. We call it worldly thinking, promoted by the devil who is opposed to the word of God as truth. He's opposed to it. Now, he don't care if you carry the Bible around don't know how to use it. 
He doesn't care if you carry the Bible around as a concealed or open weapon, as long as you don't know how to use it. But let me tell you, you are right when you take the word of God and say, I'm going to take it in and believe it, but you got to believe it all the way. Let it do its work in your life. Let it get down to the core belief system where you've got to face the mirror, where you have to face yourself and no longer deceive yourself, but rather go to the truth of the word of God says, I want you out and I want Christ in. It's not brain surgery here. I want, I want you out and I want Christ in. That's all he's going to say when he gets into your dark place of your life, when he gets down into the crevice of, of that area, all he's going to do is to say, Take a break, darling. Take a break. Let Christ do it. Let Christ do it. I've come to carry your burdens. I've come to take away it. Listen, I'm a real deal. I'm the real deal. Christ in your heart. Christ in your heart. Listen to Jeremiah 17, 9, and 10. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. The heart. The heart is more deceitful, wicked, and sick than anything else. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, can. <laughs> I made it. I, the Lord, search the heart. How does he do that? With the word of God? Listen, here's what you've missed. You want the word of God to light the path outside you. The word of God, like, like Psalms 119, the word of God will light the path before me. I will walk according to the light of the path before me. Listen, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about let the light of the word of God inside you. Walk according to it on the inside. You missed it. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verses 9 and 10, he says, the, listen to me now, the Lord searches the heart. Now, how does he do that? He does it with the word of God. He gets to the core of what you really believe, who you really believe about everything. He gets down to the core. That's, listen, that's the last place that you've got to clean up to hit super grace, really hit super grace potential. Without that, it's not going to happen. <laughs> All that knowledge in, in your left lobe. It's, in your, it's, not in, it's not what you have in your mind. It's what you have in your heart. And let me tell you, your heart is in conflict with the word of God when it gets down into the crevices of who you are, what you are, what you really believe. And you got to let the word of God down in there and you got to let it do its work because all it's going to do is going to exchange your goofiness for the purity of the life of Christ. That's a good swap any day of the week. That's a good to take the worst of you and pull it out and to put the best of him in his place, that's a good deal. And that's all I'm asking. And I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm in the midst of this myself. I'm not telling you this is easy. I'm telling you it's necessary. The Lord searches the heart. It tests the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his divine production. We've been studying Joseph on Tuesday night. I, I, I recommend you to set aside a portion of your life and come to a Tuesday night Bible study. We, we have one more week out in Moody with uh, David at his home. They've been courteous with us, and then we'll be moving back to Al's and Rhonda's home. This study in Joseph is a phenomenal study for you. I don't know what you got better to do on Tuesday night. 
But it couldn't possibly be better than this. Couldn't be possibly better for your life. <clears throat> but we've been talking about this very thing with him. Listen to Matthew 12, 33, when Jesus says the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Now, sometimes he uses flattery out of the heart to get its way. And sometimes it uses sharp stuff because it's defensive. Don't want you to get too close to who you really are. The truth of the matter is it's got to be pulled out like a bad tooth. It's got to be pulled out. And listen, it is God who searches the heart. It's he who does that work. Just let him do it. These habitual sins in your life have to be conquered. They have to be conquered. Listen to Proverbs. That should be, pro well, you don't have a paper. Proverbs 27, 19 says, says as in water, the face, face reflects water. The f when you look into water, the face reflects the face. So the heart, watch this, so the heart of man reflects his, so the heart of man reflects the man. The heart of man reflects a man. <laughs> you know, you could find that out before you lived with him five years and say, <gasps> because if you, if your heart was one with Christ, he would have pointed that out very easily to you, not go through self-deception and then have a blow up in your face. And the problem is you didn't learn anything from blowing up in your face. Well, huh? and I don't need to mess with that kind of a bomb again. Yeah, but it came from within you. Old man, old man, cosmos diabolical thinking in the heart must be addressed and replaced by the truth of the word of God. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. Listen to Proverbs 23, 7. It says, for as he thinks within himself. You know what that is? Listen. When inner dialogue happens in your mind. Now listen to me. You're going to miss this. When it happens in your mind. It's uncensored. When it happens in your heart, it's full of censorship. That's got to go. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Listen to what this says. For uh, this is Proverbs 20, 23, 7. For as he thinks within himself, that's inner dialogue, so is he in his heart. You see, when... when when, when a man thinks within himself, in his mind, it's uncensored thinking. He's willing to share it with anybody. When he gets to his heart, he doesn't go share that because of what, what, what other people might think. It's all full of censorship. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? That when it comes to the core of who you really are, you're not the open book that you say you are. Ah. Oh, you are with the mind. Oh, you give me a piece of your mind in a heartbeat. You wouldn't give up a piece of your, of your, you would give me your mind. Oh, yeah, I'll give you a piece of my mind. Wouldn't give me a piece of your heart. We used to call that where I grew up, phony baloney. Phony baloney. Psalms 44, 21 says, God knows the secrets. So that's what I'm talking about. So that's where censorship comes in. I don't want to talk about it. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't want to talk about it. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. We've got secrets of the heart. But not with God. God knows the secrets of the heart. We must replace old man cosmos diabolicus thinking with new man divine viewpoint thinking. We need to let the word of God do its work. And when it gets down to the core, we need to give up our selfish, self-deceived person. And listen, you're going to find there's a lot more under the water than you imagined. 
because you haven't even really faced the tip of the iceberg, let alone underneath it. And at some point, you got to do that. You got to this final step into maturity where God can can take you like Joseph and run you through the ringer of the world and you come out smelling great. That's a, that's a work that God does in you. That's a work of God. That's a work of God. Did you know what the last piece of the armor is in Ephesians 6, chapter 10 through 17? You know what the last piece of the armor is? This, the sword, you know what that word in the Greek is? Makaira. What's that, Makaira? Double-edged sword. And where is he driving for? The heart, right? And all this word of God you're taking in, the whole purpose is God who is searching the heart is trying to drive it to the main core, your belief system. You got to stop being defensive with him. The last piece of the armor is the sword with a definite article, the Machaira of the spirit, which is the word, the, the word, word there is Rima, not referring to the whole realm of the word of God, but categorical Bible doctrine, Rima, R-H-E-M-A, Rima. That's, that's, how he, that's how the word of God gets in there and deals with it, deals with us categorically. I started with 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. He said, there's too much strife coming from you. There's too much arguing coming from you. There's too much this coming from you. There's too much this coming from you. What's that a sign of? Carnality. What is a greater sign of? The heart. Nothing's being corrected. I can't even deal with you in ways that should correct you because you are babies. You won't let the word of God get in and deal with your stuff. You know, that's what the word of God's all about is dealing with your stuff, don't you? In today's lesson, it is. It's not just about feeding the mind intelligence. It's about changing the core of your life where you can absolutely be an open book with God because you are anyhow. Listen to this. This is what I want for you. This is my heart's desire as your pastor. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your word, the word of God, your word, O oh Lord, your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me the joy and delight of my heart. That's what I want for you. That's not going to change because you come to church and hear it. It's going to come when what you have heard begins to cut down into the crevice of your life. And you begin to take the word of God serious, not just as a book to be learned, a book to be lived. Because this Bible is not going to become that gigantic, powerful Bible in your living just because you've learned it, it's going to be because you take it to the core. The word of God is alive, powerful, sharp than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the dividing of the joints and the marrow, critic of the thoughts and intention of the heart. All of that to get to the heart. All of that. All of that. Your word I have treasured in my heart, Psalms 119.11, that I might not sin against you. How about that? Proverbs 7.3, write them. R write the word of God on the tablets of your heart. There's a clean heart. There's a clean heart. I know your heart. Your heart was cleansed at the point of salvation. But you got, you, you got habitual sins. 
You can become angry just like that. Throw fit. Where'd that come from? It was habitual. Didn't even think about it. There it was. Where'd that come from? Core. Came from the core. How are you going to get rid of it? Change the color of your hair. Because redheads just naturally do that. Are you kidding me? What, we got now hair is a root of evil? It's a root, but I don't know about evil. Okay, well, anyhow. Listen, when you do, it, I want you to write down whatever on your hand or something. And I'm going to close. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, Jesus shows you how to use a Machaira sword against the devil. Shows you how to do it. Now, listen to me. Did you write down Matthew 4, 1 through 11? I want you to tell me. I want you to look ver at verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10, and tell me what you have that are markers in that. Jesus teaches, teaches us how to use the word of God against the devil victorious. In verse 4, 7, and 10, he gives you markers. He tells you three things. He repeats it three times. He repeats it three times for you to get it. You need to get it. Okay? Let's close in a word of prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Put this, burn this in my heart because I know it is the truth. It's the last... It's the last snare of the devil in a believer's life that's on fire for God who loves the word, that finds joy and delight in it until it hits the inner sanctuary of, the, of their life, that inner core, that deep down into their heart where habitual sin comes in their life. They don't even think about it. Boom, there it is on their front doorstep. It's got to be changed. They don't know how, and so today, Father, we've dealt with it. Let the word of God do its work. Be patient. When he gets to the core, understand that what he's trying to do is get you out and get Christ in. That's the spiritual mature person. When Christ is fully formed within our life, that's called transformation. Transformation will never take place in the mind. It takes place in the heart. I want it in mind. This is a truth that has driven me. The last, beat, the last beachhead to be one. I pray, Father, you would encourage our hearts with the truth of the word of God. Take this offering we're about to receive based on grace in our life. An attitude of grace. Not law, not legalism. An attitude of grace. We're so thankful everything you've given us, Father. Everything. I mean everything. Whether we consider it good or whatever. We've come to understand what it means that all things work together. We're getting there, Father. We're getting there. We've got to root out some things that keep us a little bit uneasy about that idea. Encourage us, encourage us, encourage us, Father, to give our heart, to give our heart over to the work of God, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, so that Christ can be transformed in us, that we are one in the same person. In Jesus' name, amen.